good morning. I'm Christina Sabetta. I uh, work for NAMI Valley of the Sun, National Alliance of Mental Illness. I also co-chair the Advocacy Coalition for the Arizona Parent Family Coalition. We're a coalition made up of parent family members who have lived experience in the mental health field. Um, so my story, I started out at about age of 15, um, dealing with some, uh, dealt with some trauma when I was younger, unresolved trauma, never dealt with it. Um, still actually haven't dealt with that because it takes some time to deal with trauma, as we all know. Um, but definitely was struggling with some depression, um, some irritability, some suicidal thoughts. Uh, I was very active in sports. Um, I was, I'm only 5'8", but I was our center. Um, I was fast and I was strong, so I managed to figure it out. Um, I, I played three sports. I was a president of the National Honor Society. I had it all together. I had it figured out. And so my depression and anxiety was something that was on the back burner, not, was not a focus area of mine. Um, because I could manage, I had the coping skills. I could go perform with my fellow athletes. I could run a National Honor Society class. Um, my, my parents saw me struggle. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, always kind. I wasn't always loving at home. I was usually not very patient. Um, they saw, I knew that something was going on. So at about 15, 16, um, my family uh, dealt with some conflict, dealt with some additional trauma. I was the oldest in my family. I really sort of had to step in and help, help with my parents um, and my siblings. I was struggling, and so finally uh, my mom at the time had said, you know what, this isn't really normal, I don't think, so let me have you go see a therapist. And so I did. I'm not going to show her this recording, but I think it's important for us to know. We, She would drop me off two blocks from my therapy appointment, um, so no one saw in my small little town that I was actually going to see a therapist. I was stigmatized, so I would wear a hat, I would run into the office, I would see him. Um, at the time, I was part of the Catholic faith. Uh, he was a Catholic therapist and was very, uh, very disturbed and disrupted and f offended by some of my actions, some of my behavior, some of the things that I said. And I kept thinking to myself, yeah, but I do really well in school and sports and right, like that's got to be working well for me. Um, he's like, you know what? He basically told my mom, she's a typical teen. She'll be fine. She'll grow out of this. Um, so I saw him her about three times, it wasn't helpful at all. Felt very defeated, figured, okay, I'm just going to have to figure out how to live with this. And then I, uh, at 16, I had a suicide attempt. Um, did not know where I was going to go. Not once did anyone say, are you considering suicide? Have you thought about suicide? Do you have a plan? Not once. Saw a therapist a few times. Um, not once did I have a coach or a friend say to me, you know what, it's okay if you're not on your A game today. It's okay. You're, you're back tomorrow. Tomorrow's a new day, right? I, I was always expected to perform at that high level um, without any exceptions. Then I went to college. Uh, I wanted to save the world. I wanted to go into social work. And, uh, of course, wasn't playing my sports anymore. Didn't have my colleagues. Didn't have National Action Society. Gained a lot of weight um, and, and struggled, struggled. Um, I then moved to, fell in love, moved to Arizona. Um, and that really shook my world. I came from a very, very small town, was living then in the city of Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin, felt very included, uh, it was a very diverse community, and then I came up to Arizona, my world shook, I didn't have friends, I didn't have families, I was going to school, still working hard, um, and I started to do a bulimia. And so bulimia was the one thing that as my life felt like it was spiraling out of control, and I kept having those thoughts of the trauma that I experienced when I was younger, as it kept coming back up, that was my way of controlling what was not, what was not working within my life. It was my way of controlling my thoughts and emotions. Um, I abused my body. I turned to drugs and alcohol. Um, it, it was not a healthy point in my life. I graduated with my bachelor's. I still wonder how I did that. Um, I was working full time, going to school full time. I then went and I got my master's. In my master's class, I was sitting in the front row because again, I'm a really good student, right? And so I was sitting in the front row and I had passed out. Um, I was so malnourished. My bulimia was really uh, destroying my into my uh, destroying my body. So I passed out. I had a colleague take me to the emergency room, and as that uh, scene by Mark Twain goes, there's 
uh, two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you realize why. And it was when I came to, at the age, young age of 19, 20 years old, that this illness had almost taken my life. I realized, like, I don't deserve to live like this. I can't live like this. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of fighting the depressive thoughts every single day. I'm tired of fighting the suicidal thoughts. And I realized after that, like, you know what? Had I had someone intervene at a much earlier stage in my life, I would not be in the hospital bed right now trying to figure out where I'm going to go from here. Um, and so at that point, I really realized why I was born and uh, dedicated my life to mental health advocacy. Um, and let's see, what else do I want to share in that? Um, at 23 and 25, so just a few years after, um, my back really started to bother me. I had a lot of pain to the point where I couldn't walk. I ended up having two back surgeries. I had a laminectomy and discectomy. Why do I bring that up? Because of the anxiety and the stress I was dealing with and the depression I was dealing with, I was in so much pain. Not one person ever thought about its connection to stress. Not one person ever thought or asked me about my depression or my mental health and thought about maybe how that's connected. So at 23, I had a back surgery. At 25, I had a back surgery. My next one would be a fusion. I refused to do that because now I know what I need to be well um, and, and to, to stand up without, without that pain. Uh, at the age of 32, I got pregnant. I uh, figured, okay, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. Right? I'm going to go off my meds. I'm going to live a healthy life because now someone else is, uh, and now I'm responsible for another human being. Um, ooh, that was not good. Went off that medication. It was not a good experience. Did a lot of research on my own um, to try to determine what medications could I be on that would be safe for the baby. Um, was able to consult with my OBGYN and my primary care doctor at the time, and they were able to, um, to assist. I didn't have insurance until the age of 26. It wasn't until the age of 26 that I got a medication. Um, my parents had insurance. I could have been medicated and much sooner saved, but that was never given an option. That was not even thrown out to me. It's like, you should see a psychologist. You should see a psychiatrist. It was just like, let's try to fix you with these terrible teens. I will tell you now that, I, that I'm in the mental health field. Um, if I... If I was growing up in the stage and age of depression and anxiety and expectations, there's no way I would be alive up here today. There's absolutely no way. Um, we all know with our youth, 17% have thought about suicide at one point or another, right? I would not be here if I was, if I was a teen or 15, 20-year-old growing up now. Um, so got pregnant. Um, pregnancy went well. I did stay on one of my medications. Um, it went really well afterwards. I started to have some thoughts that, uh, some psychotic thoughts that I could not get out of my head. And I did not tell anyone. I was scared to death. And here I am, a social worker. I'm in the mental health field. And I knew if I went to my OBGYN, I should say no. But I, I, I didn't know if they knew if they were going to know how to treat me. They gave me a screening. How me fill up the straight paperwork. I'm like, oh, yes, we're coming along. I'm going to help you. They gave you screening, right? So I'm even sort of like testing them to see like what's going to happen now when I turn the screen and they see I have all these symptoms. So, hey, did you guys look at that screening? Because they didn't mention it as, they, as it came in. She goes, oh, well, let me, yeah, let me go check. She goes back. She looks at the screen. She goes, oh, yeah, it, it looks like you're struggling. I'm like, okay, cool. What are you going to do? Like, how can you help me? I'm not really sure. Let me get back to you on that. Um, never received a phone call. Um, what I didn't share at that point is I was picturing my son, who's now nine, falling down the balcony inside my house or the loft inside my house as I'm feeding, and I was picturing him falling over and breaking his head open in a million different pieces and blood everywhere, right? I wasn't able to tell anyone that, but I told someone that I would probably have law enforcement at my door. But anyone who knows I'm gonna help or who's treating me and sees me might know that I'm dealing with some psychosis, I'm dealing with some postpartum stuff, and maybe we need to do something about that. It lasted for about um, for about four to six weeks um, that I seemed to be doing better. I was able to um, meet with my primary care doc and get some of my medications adjusted um, and, and, did, and did much better. Went on to have another second child, very healthy birth. Um, and nurse both of my kids up to two years. After two years of nursing my daughter, I stopped. No one told me that this was going to happen. I hit the darkest state of depression I have ever dealt with. And remind you, I was suicidal at the age of 16, right? My hormones 
And my body, I didn't know what was wrong. Again, I'm in the mental health field. No one told me that you're going to deal with some hormonal balances, maybe some postpartum after two years of nursing your baby. Um, it wasn't until I was at a mothers of preschoolers uh, uh, group at my church that we had a presenter come in and start talking about postpartum. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm already past that one or two years. And then she mentioned breastfeeding. I was like, holy smokes. And it just started sobbing. I just started sobbing like someone else gave me the information I needed to know what I'm struggling with. Um, that was the first time I seen a psychiatrist after that. Um, I saw uh, Dr. Anne Marie Casey at Redemption Psychiatry. Um, I don't remember a lot of my healthcare providers over the years, but she's someone that definitely changed my life. I should tell her that someday. Um, but what she said to me at the time, she goes, you don't deserve to feel like this. You don't deserve to be living like this. You don't deserve to have those thoughts. You deserve, you're doing so much good for the community. You're living, you're working in mental health. You're at the Capitol advocating for mental health. You don't deserve to be struggling like this. Um, she reminded me that even my childhood trauma, like I deserved to deal with that. I deserved to deal with that. And that was so powerful. I'm like, you're right, I do deserve that. I don't deserve to live like this. She got me on the medication. She really honored my choice. She looked at my symptoms. She's like, okay, there is no magical pill that's going to take all these symptoms away, right? So let's figure out what's most important to you. All right, cool. Thank you for letting me have control over my mental health care and the treatment process. Um, now, many years later, I, um, I, I, I'm in a great place. Um, I, I know what I need for my recovery. I take medication every morning. Um, I know when I don't, and so does my husband. Um, we have, I openly talk about it, right? And so he knows if I'm irritable, he tells me, babe, go, go to the hike. <laughs> Time to go to the gym. I'll be here with the kids when you get back. Awesome. Cool. That's exactly what I need. Um, I, of course, I found the Lord throughout this process. Um, I have now, you know, come to a place where I really need to eat healthy and stay active in order to keep my mind and body whole and healthy. Um, I, I, and I, now my son, who's in fourth grade, who's actually doing really well, but of course we went through times where he struggled as well. He's going to be my next civil rights attorney. Um, he struggles with ADHD. Um, and for the first time in four years, I just had a parent-teacher conference on Monday. And I'm like, he's a joy to have in class. First time I've ever heard that. Um, so really excited about that. Um, so I really want to wrap up and say that as someone who is an advocate and can advocate for myself, I struggled and really didn't get the treatment that I needed until I was about 32, 33 years old. I struggled in silence, sort of, right? I was still vocal about it, still trying to get help across the way. And if people would have seen my signs and my symptoms and asked me when I was going for my back surgery, is this stress related at all? Are you seeing a therapist? Are you on medication? Is there anything else you tried? Um, that would have been a game changer for me. That would have been a game changer. Had I went to that therapist and you recommended it, maybe I get a psyche eval, maybe I go see a psychologist. If I had a coach say, hey, you know, what's going on with you? We just missed you in practice for the last three sessions. This isn't normal for you. Uh, what's going on? I might have been in a different place. Had someone told me it was okay not to be okay today. Cool. Thank you. Like, that's what I needed to hear. Um, and so I, I asked you to really sort of think about, think about the voice our voice and how important it is and how much we can share with you. We're the experts on our own stories. We can share a lot with you that will help explain what we're presenting at the time. Um, you can even give us like three minutes. We'll sum it up really quickly for you, but I think that's super valuable and helpful for us to hear. Being able to connect of all of the healthcare providers that we've seen, no one was willing to pick up the phone and have those kind of phone calls. Um, and not one until I got to see my psychiatrist uh, towards the towards the last ten years of my life. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know just listen, be humble, right? Again, we're the experts on our own stories, um, and and just and just be there. You know, I always think about the fact that it's not a matter of what's wrong with us, but what has happened to us. Um, so we know that we all have a story, and that story is valuable and can be really helpful as you work with patients. Right. Thank you.